Other ways to improve citizen police relationships. A presentation by Paul Brackey. Author, publisher of American Leadership Books. Author of nine books on criminal justice issues. In a previous video on improving citizen police relationships, I discussed the problem of citizen police killings, the problem of racial tension, a lack of understanding about police use of force guidelines, and the role of the media in increasing citizen police tensions. Now I want to discuss some other key citizen police issues. These four key issues are, complaints of misconduct by the police. Stop and identify laws. Police brutality. Breakdown of law and order, protests and riots. I'll briefly describe them and provide some suggested solutions for each issue. Complaints of misconduct by the police. Misconduct complaints commonly occur for these reasons. Certain police actions might be justified under the circumstances, but they can be blown up into believing the police acted wrongly. Citizens can develop this faulty belief because they don't understand why the police have taken certain permitted actions. It is important to look critically at the nature of the encounter to determine who is really at fault. Or maybe there is no single fault when the shooting is due to uncertain actions on both sides. If there is uncertainty about fault, this could mean the case is more of a tragic accident based on misperception and miscommunications. The traffic stop is a common example of when citizens complain about police misconduct. Commonly, a police officer stops a motorist for what is just a routine traffic infraction. Then the citizen becomes hostile or looks like he is reaching for a gun. This sudden seemingly hostile action by the citizen leads a police officer to make a split-second decision to protect his or her own life by shooting and killing the citizen. Such cases can be quickly turned into both a liberal attack on the police officer for committing murder and the police department for protecting the officer from the charge. One of the riskiest situations that police face is the normally routine car stop. Most often these stops are for minor speeding, erratic driving, or expired license plate offenses. When an infraction might lead to discovering much more serious offenses, the driver and passengers may be very nervous and react violently, particularly if a weapon is available. The outcome of these situations is all too frequently deadly, either for the driver, the police or both. Following are my suggestions for what the police should do to better handle routine traffic stops. Police officers should not have to get out of their vehicle for a routine traffic stop. At night, officers should instruct drivers to turn on their car interior lights and place both hands on the steering wheel. Officers should record the license plate of the offending vehicle and audibly advise the driver on a broadcast from their car that he or she has been issued an electronic citation which will require an appearance in court on a particular date. These procedures to automate giving a ticket will greatly reduce the risk to police and civilians alike. Here are my suggestions for responding to other complaints of misconduct. The police or a committee of legislators, possibly including some citizens, should develop national training guidelines and policies for police departments nationwide. A training program might be developed to increase police awareness of local community needs and show how officers could better interact with local citizens in a spirit of trust and cooperation. Stop and identify laws. The stop and identify laws are statutes that allow the police to detain people and ask them to identify themselves. Commonly people have to show an ID. If individuals refuse to properly identify themselves or show a false ID, the police can arrest them. Liberals often claim that abuse occurs in those cities and states where there is a large minority population. They claim the police are using the stop and identify laws to check if a Hispanic is an illegal immigrant. Another complaint is that sometimes the police use stop and identify laws to target someone believed to be on parole or probation to investigate them further. But the police might do so when the individual is not doing anything illegal, then find a reason to make an arrest. Arrests and convictions are particularly easy in inner-city neighborhoods where drugs are openly bought and sold on the streets. While such arrests may be justified, often the police make them for practical reasons which are not justified. 
For instance, it is far easier to make arrests that lead to convictions or pleas in drug possession cases than in murder cases, which require much more investigative efforts. So the police devote more resources than they should to small drug possession cases than to investigating homicides. Here are my suggestions for dealing with stop and identify law complaints. The police should be given clearer guidelines on when and when not to use stop and identify commands to citizens. The police should only use these stop and identify requests when they have reasonable cause to suspect the individual is involved in some illegal activity. The police should not use stop and identify laws if an individual is engaged in seemingly ordinary activities. If a suspect is observed in the vicinity of a crime in this limited time period, two officers must be involved in any stop and frisk apprehension. If a suspect runs, the police may follow. A single police officer should call for backup before engaging in a stop and frisk apprehension. No officer should shoot to kill unless the suspect appears to be reaching for a weapon, in which case a police officer would be justified in shooting in self-defense. The police profiling of minorities by police should be greatly restricted to include stops only when, one, a weapon has been displayed or fired in a local incident in the past hour, and two, a description of both the suspect and a vehicle used in that incident match the vehicle spotted by the police. Profiling minorities who are on foot in the close vicinity of a crime should be restricted to one hour following the crime. This will limit any targeting of suspects to those who can realistically be close enough to have committed the crime. Police brutality Both liberals and some police officials have questioned whether the police have been too brutal in some situations. Normally, the police should follow guidelines on how much force to use in making an arrest or restraining a suspect. The usual policy requires the police to use only as much force as necessary to effect an arrest or control a suspect. Here are my suggestions for dealing with accusations of police brutality. It is important to get the facts by interviewing the accuser or accusers and any police officers accused to get both sides of the story. Ideally get videos of the incidents and reports of witnesses to determine if there really was a case of police brutality, beyond ordinary use of force required to arrest or restrain a suspect. If the charge is wrong, advise the accuser why this is the case. If there is evidence to support the charge, then discipline and retrain the officer appropriately and advise the accuser and any witnesses that you are doing so and keep them informed to the extent you can, subject to the laws of disclosure about private personnel matters. All police officers on patrol and their vehicles should be equipped with cameras that record all incidents in order to show what really happened. This will help to counter videos taken by citizens that might suggest police wrongdoing because it only shows part of the incident. Breakdown of law and order, killings of police and riots. The recent killings of police in ambush attacks have occurred due to the growing hostility of citizens to the police in certain areas. These ambush attacks have occurred most notably in the inner cities. Protests by black communities over the loss of their members to police action are increasingly leading to riots and looting. Public sentiment is often revved up by the media eager to cover any confrontations. Such stories by the media make such confrontations even more likely to occur. Here are my suggestions for dealing with the media's role in the breakdown of law and order. The media should be encouraged not to fan the waves of racial indignation with each unfortunate exceptional incident between police and blacks, since false claims of misconduct can lead to protests and even riots. The media could serve the public better with more investigative reporting regarding trends in police action and potential abuse. Here are my suggestions for what the police should do in dealing with the breakdown of law and order. The police should receive additional training to help prevent racial protests from developing into race riots. The police training should involve close cooperation between protest organizers and the police to reduce the likelihood of serious race riots. The police who provide security for protests should be specially selected and trained not to overreact. Still more issues and suggestions to consider. We need more protections for our police because they are our first line of defense in combating crime. 
The police have been unfairly demonized by many liberals and the media in America, though most police officers perform their duties selflessly and with devotion. As tensions grow between the police and black urban communities, they need additional safeguards, and so do the citizens they apprehend. The following should be done to reduce the hazards of a police-citizen confrontation, both to save lives and reduce costs to the criminal justice system. Require officers to record their contacts with citizens, including when they fire their guns. The police should record their contacts, so they have evidence they can use in case their response to citizens or reason for shooting are questioned by citizens. The use of deadly force guidelines and the training for applying them need to be overhauled and standardized. The revised deadly force guidelines should be applied in situations which present a clear and present danger for police officers or civilians who are nearby. Use of force guidelines and training should take into consideration local variations. If training isn't available for small rural police forces, their officers should be required to receive such training at the nearest larger police force facility. Community policing can work both in low-income minority communities and middle and upper-income communities. The key to community policing working is by adapting it to the different types of crime problems in each community. Some different community policing approaches that work are, having crime prevention meetings to provide advice on what to do, from protecting against inner city gang violence to protecting one's home or car in the suburbs against a burglary, giving talks at schools and community centers, helping citizens create neighborhood watch groups and speaking to these groups, increasing patrol on foot, bicycle, or scooter rather than driving around in a car, partnering with other organizations, such as non-profit service providers, private businesses, and the media, decentralizing police decision-making, so lower-ranking officers have more discretion. Close to 100% of larger agencies claim to have adopted community policing, according to recent research. The growing use of technology by police forces around the nation needs to be combined with more direct citizen police contact. This technology can help to increase police effectiveness in many ways, which include, the police using cameras to record police activities, more quickly pinpointing the location of a crime. Since technology can reduce direct citizen police contact, the police need to supplement it by proactively reaching out to increase one-on-one -on -one contact with members of the community. One way the police can increase citizen police contact is by having crime prevention meetings. Another way to increase citizen police contact is dropping in on local businesses to see how things are going and ask for suggestions on dealing with crime in the area. Under free speech laws, citizens have the ability to film and share information about police actions. Though free speech laws include the ability to film and record these actions, some citizens have been stopped from doing this. Citizens should explicitly be allowed to video all police actions, as long as they don't interfere with these actions. One program that works well in many departments is offering a Citizen Police Academy to help improve community relationships. The CPA does this by helping participants better understand the procedures, responsibilities, demands, and laws officers face. This approach helps to increase the community's empathy and sympathy for law enforcement officers. It helps to humanize law enforcement officers so citizens get to know the actual person behind the badge. These academies cover these major topics, the department's organization and ethics, an overview of the legal system, procedures on the use of force, firearms training, traffic, DWI enforcement, forensics, recruiting, jail tours, ride-alongs. Some include SWAT and K-9 demonstrations. These programs can be adapted to the needs of citizens in each area. What is critical for success is encouraging increased personal relationships between the police and members of the community. The program can help prevent crime and protect the community. The police shouldn't just respond after a crime has been committed. To contact us. American Leadership Books. 8 Porsche Drive. Little Rock, Arkansas, 72212. www.americanleadershipbooks.com, brackyp at gmail.com. For more information. American Leadership Books. Little Rock, Arkansas.
www.americanleadershipbooks.com. Info at americanleadershipbooks.com.